Fiona, thank you very much uh, for joining us. It's uh, really great uh, to have you uh, here. Could you tell us a little bit about the town you grew up in and the journey from there to uh, the White House working with uh, presidents? One of the reasons that I did make uh, my journey from uh, the northeast of England, from County Durham, at a really pretty grim time that I'll just uh, mention um, quickly, to where I, you know, I'm today. I've, I've actually spent a lot of time sitting in this Zoom box in my office at, at home, but you know, theoretically, to the Brookings Institution and the White House and all the other jobs that I've uh, done uh, there, is because even in the darkest times, County Durham was able to maintain its a budget for cultural um, issues and for education. And I was really very much a beneficiary of all of that. I was born in 1965 uh, at a, the very time in County Durham where all the coal mines started to close down. I mean, as many of you were aware in the audience, County Durham, like many other places in the northeast of England, in the Midlands, uh, was one of the oldest uh, centres of coal mining um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the uh, centres of the Industrial Revolution with railways and shipyards and uh, large steelworks, uh, pretty much uh, dominated by heavy industry and nationalised industry. And, you know, I think, you know, for the rest of the UK, bearing in mind that a nationalised industry really dominated places like the North East is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the revitalisation of communities. When I was growing up, I didn't actually know anybody really, apart from uh, maybe the local plumber or electrician or some of the people who run some of the small shops in town who actually worked in the private sector. Everybody worked in British something. My dad had been a coal miner. Um, in the 1960s, uh, just as I came along, all the coal mines were closing down. My dad had gone from one job in one coal mine to the next. Well, the coal mines uh, were all closing. These were all small mines, um, really concentrated in pit villages, like the one that my dad grew up um, in, just a few miles outside of Bishop Auckland. The only other work was in, again, nationalised uh, heavy industry. He worked briefly in a steelworks. That was also on the verge of closing down then in a brickworks. Same kind of thing happened. And eventually ended up working in the National Health Service in the local hospital. That whole care economy became uh, the mainstay of the community, especially for manual workers like my dad with no qualifications whatsoever because he'd gone down the coal mines at age uh, 14. So when um, you know I come along, Already, it's a downward trajectory in uh, the whole of the county. My hometown, Bishop Auckland, starts to fall on really hard times. <clears throat> and in the 1980s, it literally falls off a cliff because that's, of course, the period uh, when Margaret Thatcher comes in in 1979 and onwards and tries to um, institute the mass privatization of all the heavy nationalized industry. And overnight, hundreds of thousands of people lose their jobs. It leads to the, the uh, hollowing out of the local economy. Many of the shops close down because people don't have any uh, money to spend there as well. And basically it's kind of growing up against that kind of backdrop of hollowed out communities and people still trying to keep things together. The title of the book, uh, There's Nothing For You Here, actually comes from what my dad said to me in 1984 when I was leaving school. I was lucky enough to uh, uh, pass my A-levels and you know, doing pretty well in school. It was the opportunity because of the local education authority, County Durham, to have um, a university education paid for me. But my dad was basically telling me, you know, if you leave to go to university, you're not going to be able to come back here after you've finished. There's nothing for you here. Adam, I'm getting quite a bit of feedback. Are you still able to hear me? Can everyone hear OK? Yeah, everyone can hear you. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm getting a kind of a rushing sound. It could be, you know, the old hot air that I'm expending here, of course. You know, but in any case, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't just sort of talking into a void. But, the, you know, the, basically the, the whole point of, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the book and, and the, the personal story is education as a portal. You know, education is opening up. Um, a whole host of opportunities for me that wouldn't otherwise have been available, that certainly weren't available to my parents, you know, because of the development of the comprehensive school system, even though my local comprehensive school, Bishop Barrington, was very much under-resourced and something of a failing school, it had been the old secondary modern school. Opportunity was that great portal. The problem, of course, um, for people like me going off to university, that with that admonition of my dad, you know, there's nothing for you here, means that communities like Bishop Auckland and others, you know, around County Durham got hollowed out as well, you know, kind of brain drain of people having to go elsewhere to look for work. 
and uh, to you know look for education as well and, of, and for the most part not coming back now I had a you know well, I would say I over fulfilled the educational plan I went on <clears throat> from St Andrews in Scotland to get a scholarship to go to Harvard University I got scholarships from the British Council to go to study in what was then the Soviet Union um, I decided to study Russian against the backdrop of the Cold War and the Euro missile crisis and at every turn I had a grant or somebody assisting me and the other you know various messages of the book is that all of uh, life is really a team sport I mean it literally took a lot of community help contacts uh, all kinds of interventions and assistance and grants uh, and other opportunities for me to to move forward and I tried to uh, you know in many respects package all of that together in the book to make the case that you're making in these discussions and elsewhere about the importance um, of uh, you know serious sustained funding uh, to bridge um, all of those gaps in opportunity and inequality uh, that we still see in the UK, but also that I've seen in the United States as well. And I saw the same patterns playing out in the United States after I came here in 1989, especially playing out in the same old industrial areas, obviously not dominated by nationalised industry, but heavy industry as they made the transition in the 80s and 90s as well. Do you feel that... <clears throat> that sort of hollowing out, that disempowerment, impoverishment of uh, communities that you described so eloquently there has played a significant role in the rise of far-right populism, which obviously you've been sort of up close and personal with in your recent career. Has that been a key part, do you think, of the rise of that sort of politics in the last 10, 20 years or so? I think it has. And look, I made the comparison in the book uh, between and among three places. The United Kingdom, obviously, where I started off in the Northeast, which gave me a very specific perspective. Then Russia, the, the former Soviet Union that I spent all of my professional life looking at and you know, first visited in 1987 as an undergraduate in the UK on the British Council scholarship, seeing kind of the demise of uh, the Soviet Union playing out. And then um, the United States, where you know, I saw the same phenomenon that I'd uh, witnessed in the other two places also on a different, slightly uh, different time scale, but with very much of the same features. In uh, the UK, um, as I was growing up in the Northeast, you know, in the 1980s period in particular, saw the rise of far right parties. And they really did um, make an impact, particularly among um, many of the disaffected middle aged, you know, guys, um, you know, I, I knew uh, growing up who had lost their jobs, felt like they'd lost their identity. We saw, you know, the kind of uh, the National Front, the, the British National Party, which I think emerges in the same, you know, sort of time frame. And then some of the other, you know, fringe groups. Even though, you know, obviously in um, the, the northeast of England and certainly in Bishop Balkan, there wasn't any immigrants. Um, it was just this kind of sense of dislocation. In Russia, um, in the 1990s, where I was spending an awful lot of time professionally there doing research, my PhD, and also for a program I was working with from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, mass privatization there under the rubric of shock therapy, very similar to what had happened uh, in the Thatch years in the, the UK, also similar phenomenon to the northeast of England, getting rid of this, you know, nationalized heavy industry privatization leading to the formation of oligarchical capitalism, you know, that we've sort of seen today in Russia, but also um, people feeling um, dislocated, um, completely having loose, losing a sense of their identity, their identity tied to work, but their identity tied to the larger state. And look, one of the reasons why we see the invasion of Ukraine today, this very timely topic, all of the horrors that are unfolding there, is because Vladimir Putin himself fits into that pattern of somebody who has deep-seated grievances from the loss of the Soviet empire, the loss of the identity that was tied to that, uh, the loss of a certain place and loss of, loss of a certain industrial structure as well. The people who form the base of support from Vladimir Putin come from the old Rust Belt industries, the big manufacturing centers of Russia, uh, the same places that underwent the same kind of dislocation that I saw in the northeast of England and later in the United States. And look, the phenomenon that produced President Trump in the United States in 2016 is also rooted in exactly those um, same circumstances. It's all of the places that uh, provided the base for President Trump 
were regions going through a massive period of change. In some cases, it might be demographic change. Um, in the United States, you know, just like in London and other big cities in the UK, you were also having, you know, quite rapid pace of demographic change. Um, I mean, everyone's very familiar um, with the issues of race and um, identity in uh, the United States, I think, at this uh, particular point. But when you look and you pull apart uh, the election results in 2016, remember, they were extraordinarily tight. Uh, put, uh, Trump um, basically won by an extraordinary narrow margin in the Electoral College uh, rather than by the popular vote in 2016. And the margin was about 70,000 votes, give or take, in three counties in three states, which all happened to be in the Rust Belt, the old industrial heartland of the United States, where people had really suffered from this um, dislocation of deindustrialization. And it also suffered from uh, the other impacts of the global economic financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. And many of them had uh, you know, lost uh, their position and financial status again there. And there were also uh, counties where there was a sort of a tipping point demographically where you know, the working class white population saw themselves being displaced in some fashion. And all of these came together uh, in uh, this election in 2016, which of course propelled into uh, the presidency for the very first time, a really openly populist, right-wing, uh, nationalist, nativist uh, politician, which of course um, had a dramatic impact on the shape of US politics. So yes, all of those phenomena have fed into this. And it's we've seen over this long period as well, the rise of the kind of charismatic uh, populist leader, someone who promises to people a kind of restoration of their identity, their socioeconomic uh, status, and their place brought more broadly in society. So, so, so insightful, thank you so much, Fiona. We're getting questions coming through now uh, from the audience. A uh, Couple of questions specifically about the leveling up agenda. Given that link you made between disempowerment, impoverishment, and the rise of the far right, what's your sense in terms of what the leveling up agenda here in the UK, how serious is it? Will it begin to address that sense of disempowerment and maybe be an effective way of taking on that sort of politics? Well, I certainly hope it's serious. I mean, I, I had a careful look at the white paper, which I think makes an extremely good case uh, for why levelling up is necessary. I mean, obviously, you know, somewhat um, overdue, seeing as that you and um, New Local have been at this for a couple of decades now. I think it's, you know, very obvious, um, you know, for myself as well, you know, growing up in that environment and seeing these massive gaps in opportunity and the um, persistent uh, inequalities and discrepancies between, you know, the North and, you know, the the South and within um, London as well, you know, among uh, and between different boroughs. Uh, I think, you know, the, the bigger question is whether um, all of the sort of totality of recommendations will really, you know, hang together. And, you know, as the theme of your conferences, uh, also about the empowerment of local communities, which is pretty critical. And look, one of the reasons that, you know, again, I succeeded uh, and, uh, and it really ought to have been more people than, you know, just one-offs um, uh, was because of um, community activism and assistance and support. And I got money from my local Rotary Club, as impoverished as they were in the 1980s, you know, with lots of local businesses closing down. I got um, small grants from the Durham Miners Association. I mean, a lot of the trade unions and those, you know, workers associations have been hollowed out now. They weren't just, you know, renowned for strike action, as it sort of seemed in the 70s and 80s. But they were also in the business of supporting their members and their families and trying to give them additional opportunity. Back in the 1950s, my dad, even though he you know, left school at 14, uh, basically in the 1940s to go down the war, uh, down the, um, uh, the, the, the mines, you know, against the backdrop of nationalization after World War II, um, there were um, funds within the Durham Miners Association for you know, what was called then miners' welfare activities. It would be football clubs, you know, everything from, um, you know, pigeon uh, fanciers and uh, allotments, uh, you know, for gardens, but it was also education. My dad um, was actually extraordinarily well-read because he went to miners' literary societies 
and um, you know was assisted you know with reading and writing and arithmetic and you know all the kinds of things that he you know might need you know for life in general uh, and you know those were very important components uh, the local communities raise a lot of money themselves um, you know to basically support um, uh, the, the miners and uh, you know their families and uh, and children as well and that was kind of the roots of the kind of you know work that you're trying to do now is kind of giving the communities themselves the opportunity to do things you know we had in our local town you know which many um, towns have the citizens advice bureau in the local libraries you know where you could go and ask for information i mean i found that when i needed to get information there was always someone in the community would be would be able to help it's just that they didn't really have a lot of resources all of this was done on a shoestring there wasn't the ability really to generate money and there certainly wasn't um you know, the ability to be able to set a much broader agenda to consolidate uh, things. This is why County Durham's making a bid for the um, UK City of Culture to try to pull together a whole bunch of disparate activities, which people have uh, uh, put a lot of time and effort into themselves, but they don't have that resource base because a lot of those impoverished communities, no tax base, all of the industry is gone. You know, there's very much uh, a set of limitations on the funding uh, for concrete activities. So, I mean, that's something that, um, you know, I, I really hope will be addressed in uh, in levelling up. How to create sustained funding uh, and uh, the ability to accumulate and develop assets for communities and give communities themselves the say in uh, the, the larger set of activities related to, to levelling up. Not something that's, you know, kind of a plan that has to be fulfilled that's uh, basically uh, set uh, by the centre. Because, you know, as we know, in national politics, the agenda often changes, priorities change. But at the local and regional level, they don't. They stay pretty much the same. We've got a question from Mark Freeman about um, has the time for radical change arrived? Um, given, this sort, given this sort of agenda has been spoken about for decades, uh, you know, we used to talk about the north-south divide, didn't we, about 35 years ago, and it keeps... But nothing seems to really move the dial on issues of region inequality and hollowed out communities. But I wonder what's your take on the historical moment we're in? It feels like this is a moment of shift. Geopolitics is shifting very significantly. We've got the cost of living crisis. It feels like a number of crises coming together. Do you think, are you pessimistic about that? Or do you think this is a moment when there could be a radical shift that addresses the sorts of problems you identify and how radical, how necessarily radical is that change, do you think? Well, look, I think it's uh, essential right now. I mean, as you're saying, we're at a pivotal point, and I'm sure this is what everybody in the audience is thinking. This is like one of those moments of, of, of massive change that we saw at the end of World War II as well and at the end of the Cold War. I'm somewhat pessimistic because we don't always take advantage of these moments, right? I mean, you know, we see uh, the need for change, we've, as you've mentioned. I mean, we've seen it over and over again. You know, the um, question that I was asked when I went for my um, Frank Knox um, fellowship um, application and interview um, back, you know, in um, 1989 was about the North-South divide <laughs> because that was in the press all of the time. And for me, that wasn't just some theoretical question. I was living it. And I think that that's, you know, part of the reason I got this um, fellowship to go to um, to Harvard because I made it real. I said, look, you know, it's like I, I, I live this every day. I see it. You know, when I was growing up, going to London was like going to Saturn. It was kind of like going to Mars. It, it just that there was just no connectivity. And, you know, you felt that kind of rupture, that division in, in, in every aspect of, of life, economically, socially, culturally, you know, you name it. And, you know, so it's long overdue, um, as we're saying here. But look, we've got now a confluence of, of, of major crises, climate change. I mean, back in the 80s, we knew that we had to address it we didn't although i have to you know take my hat off to margaret thatcher and others that they did address acid rain which was the big issue of the 1980s we did do an awful lot of issue of, of things to address the ozone hole some of the things that we were really concerned about um, at the time i mean people in the audience who are my age will remember you know some of uh, those discussions now but we certainly didn't make a dent in the larger phenomena that we're dealing with now so we absolutely have to do something and we can do this at the local and regional level uh, to start to address <clears throat> some of the climate change um, issues particularly in local generation of, of energy, you know, for example, and some of the other uh, things that we want could envisage related to that COVID. We're not out of the pandemic yet. I mean, even though, of course, there's been a massive shift. Talk about accelerating a lot of the dislocations and, you know, the economic change, artificial intelligence, 
um, has been accelerated as a result of this. Look, I'm zooming in. Who would have thought I could zoom into a conference um, even just uh, a couple of years ago? That's uh, part of the, the byproduct of uh, the pandemic. We've got the rise of China and the kind of implications of major global um, economic shifts. That's been underway, of course, since um, 2008 and 2009 and the uh, great economic crisis and recession and then the 2010 uh, joining um, of the WTO by China. And now we've got this huge war in uh, Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, the first um, massive military uh, action since World War II in Europe and the huge outflux, um, phenomenal outflux of, of refugees. I know that the UK is grappling with this now, but um, this is one of those pivotal moments. And look, if we don't take this opportunity to do something different, then I, I, I you know, all bets are off in, in, in my view here. That really is, uh, you know, kind of one of our last opportunities here to tackle things. And it's pretty evident by the nature of politics, what I've seen in the United States, um, in the UK, particularly now what we're seeing in Russia, where there is no accountability there for the, the guy on top. I mean, what we see in Russia here is the dangers of too much concentration of power, not just in one party or in one group, but in one person. Uh, Vladimir Putin isn't a member of a political party. There's no checks and balances in the system. He does operate within um, a state apparatus, but it's one with a very extreme vertical of power. That decision to invade was made for a handful of people, maybe, you know, um, as small as sort of five, even less people. Uh, again, no um, check on it, uh, no room for dissent, uh, certainly no room in Russia for um, local autonomy in the kind of political level. And now we're kind of much more of a sort of repression now of local initiative that actually had created quite a vibrant civil society in Russia. That's all being crushed. So the, the prognosis for Russia looks very bleak and we have to make sure that we don't follow down that path. I talk in the book about Russia being the ghost of Christmas future, not for the UK, but for the United States because of the phenomenon that we saw emerging under um, Trump. And of course, that hasn't gone away. But I think in, you know, in the UK, given that history of vibrant localism and, and regionalism and you know, the um, more of the checks and balances in the UK system, kind of a more flexible party and, you know, pretty strong local government system. There's a real opportunity to be a trailblazer here. But again, if you don't act and you don't act now, the, the sense of kind of radical change driven by uh, necessity in this time frame, you're going to really lose uh, this opportunity. This is, you know, one in which a window is open for a short period of time and then it closes because of the kind of pressure of, uh, of larger events. Time for one more uh, question. And it's a question that's been upvoted a lot by our audience. So I'm, I'm going to put it to you, which is about um, the media, which has obviously played such a big part in the rise of uh, far right populism and shifting the whole political landscape. Uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Hayward has asked about um, the hollowing out of local media is one of the phenomenon of the hollowing out of the community more widely and people turning to social media more for their information. Is there a way of addressing that, uh, that hollowing out of local media? Is there a way of addressing the sometimes uh, dangerous influence of social media, do you think? Look, that's that's spot on. And in the United States, you see the the kind of the rise of populist politics correlated very strongly with the demise of um, local media. So in the United States over the last 10, 15 years, there's been the loss of 7,000 no, uh, local newspapers and media outlets. I mean, of course, you know, the United Kingdom didn't have quite that same, uh, it's not the same size, obviously, but that same, um, you know, rich um, ecosystem of, of local media. But you do see in, in the UK, and coming from the northeast of England, there's the Northern Echo, for example. I'll just give a quick plug for the Northern Echo, which is one of the oldest uh, regional newspapers and still going um, pretty strong in the UK. And you can really kind of see there, you know, somebody, again, I used to read that every single day and I still, you know, check it out online. What's really kind of uh, vital about the Northern Echo is people see themselves reflected in the news. There is still national content, there's international content, but there's also a very strong local content which draws people in. And when they've done polling about, you know, why the Northern Echo still remains popular, it's precisely that because people say, I see myself in it. And there's still been, you know, not a lot of um, around in Bishop Auckland and County Durham, for example, a, a lot of, um, you know, self-published um, uh, uh, in, in some respects, uh, local press. There's a Bishop's Press that looks like literally it was kind of hand you know, <laughs> back in the day. 
that gets distributed. There's, you know, kind of uh, local um, presses that, you know, kind of pick up on local advertising, but obviously with the rise and fall of local economies, that takes a hit. And one way of addressing this, I know that there's been all of this debate about the BBC and the kind of future of the BBC, the funding structure of the BBC is pretty arcane, but it's been really important to have the BBC uh, particularly, um, I have to say, here in the United States and, you know, more broadly internationally is a kind of GPS system, you know, for people kind of navigating their way around this very complicated information space now of a kind of a go to place for basic information. And part of that is the local regional um, information. It's been that, um, you know, concentrated effort of moving um, some of uh, the, the BBC activities out into the regions. I mean, you've always had uh, the um, regional perspectives, but doing more of that, just like in the levelling up agenda, thinking about moving out uh, some of the activities of government to local areas, the building up of the passport office in Durham, some of the treasury to Darlington, you know, from the northeast uh, perspective, thinking about that and how you could find a different funding structure for revitalising local news. Uh, including on social media. Uh, it's it's a really part of the constraint is the advertising environment. So thinking about different, you know, asset bases and funding structures for this. I think it's more doable on the UK level than it might be in the United States, for example, you know, just a huge country, you know, different uh, uh, regional uh, perspectives. The United uh, Kingdom still has a kind of a, a advantage of being fairly compact, uh, but with a lot of differentiation uh, on a regional and local level. So I think a lot of active thinking about ways in which one could reinvigorate uh, local news. Um, look, Facebook, even though it's actually been had a lot of flaws, um, has had a model that has been quite useful for local communities uh, and um, local groups and uh, social media groups have been you know, plugged into a few uh, local Facebook uh, groups for, for my region still, where I managed to kind of pick up on um, uh, things that are happening in Bishop Auckland, you know, local community um, activities. That still plays a pretty vital role. A lot of those are self-financed, you know, obviously, or not financed at all. But thinking about that as part of local assets, part of local communities, you know, as uh, Jonathan Hayward said, I think that um, is pointing out that's pretty vital. And I know, Adam, that you and, you know, your colleagues at New Local think about this as well. But I think that is a vital part. And, you know, the politics in the US underscore that. I mean, how did um, Trump really affect his rise? It was through a really aggressive use of social media uh, and taking advantage of the disappearance of uh, local content uh, and local newspapers, because then all local news became national, which has been extraordinarily detrimental to the health of US democracy and has you know, the same implications for the United Kingdom. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I know you are massively in demand at the moment. You're doing loads of media talking about the situation in Ukraine and giving your excellent analysis of the situation in Russia as well. So we really appreciate you sparing the time to talk about your journey uh, and your book and your understanding of populism. Thank you so much, really insightful. Thanks loads.